Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of That Pop Culture Show, where we explore everything and anything pop culture. We're your hosts. I'm Cody Frederick. I'm Jason DeBoard. Let's get poppin'. On this week's Pop Profile, we have with us founder of Mocha, Lawrence Klein. Lawrence, what the hell is Mocha? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that introduction. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Mocha is the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art, uh, which I founded in 2001 in New York City. Oh, wow, okay. And, and, and a part of it was also the Mocha Art Festival, which we started in... 2002. So originally, like you got into, you're just a, you're a collector, you're a fan of comic and cartoon art. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. I love it. I think it's great. And and you think about the stories that it tells mm-hmm. and the, the different genres that it's in, from the New York Times op art page to the New Yorker to comic books to comic strips and the newspapers to animation. It, it's all over, and everybody so sees some part of it. What was your first comic book? My first comic book was Star Trek number one and She-Hulk number one. Was Star Trek number one, was that like, what was it, Gold Key or something? Or? No, no, it was the uh, Marvel version. Oh, okay. Yeah, what year da- What year was that? Oh, early 80s, like okay. probably 81, something like that. And those were the first ones I remember going to a comic book shop and getting. Okay. I mean, I had been collecting comics, you know, uh, from newsstands. You know, we'd go right. to the pharmacy or to an airport or something right. and something to read. And my parents would be like... I didn't. I had a learning disability. I didn't really read, but comic books. I was able to read and really enjoy it. And so I was getting comic books. And then we went to a flea market, and there was this guy who was selling all these comic books, like boxes and boxes. <laughs> right. And they were on the wall, and it was so cool. And, 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 and I'm like, those two look cool. And then my dad's like, all right. And the rest is history. Well, what's interesting is when you said comic and cartoon art, it did not click to me that it is all car- comics, like you're talking like, you said New Yorker, like just the quick singular panel right, comics exactly. that, you know, that, you, that you'd see in New Yorker or even like the jokey ones that you might even see in like, like Playboy, for example. Exactly. Uh, and so you, got, you would collect originals and you'd show them or you would just kind of tell the story of comics for the history of comics in general? At the museum? Yeah. Kind of both, you know, show different aspects of comic and cartoon art. Right. So we did one of New York, how different comic and cartoon art um, uh, was related to New York City. Wow. And so that was like Archie and, you know, Playboy. And, right. And, you know, Marvel and all those kind of things. And then there's ones that were very specific, like Stan Lee and Todd McFarlane. Um, there was women comics and, you know, comic strips. And at that point, digital comic strips were kind of new. Uh, so it was like those type of things. World War II Bond cartoons, which were done by very famous artists of the time. Um, that were used to sell bonds. Right, uh, right, like, so, like Riveter, like Riveter Rosie kind of stuff. Exactly, that, exactly. So, so, but this was sort of born out of having a learning disability. So is it like visual storytelling? Is that like kind of what was the most appealing to you about comics? Yeah, yeah, and, and it, you know, it was, it was easy to read, mm-hmm. um, and it was enjoyable to read. Um, right. And so something I could get into and really learn more and read more, and, and it, it really helped me, and it taught me a lot. When you when it taught you a lot, you meant like from a social aspect, or you actually felt like you learned things about science and history and like all of that. A little bit, sure, sure. I mean, I learned how to read better uh, growing up, being around comics, going to the comic conventions with my dad. Sure. I learned about how to negotiate, how to how to buy, what oh, to look for, collectibles, mm. right? What 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 are real collectibles? Weren't what aren't? What are fads, right? You know, I, I learned about keeping things, what, what means something, what may not mean anything. So what was that progression for you? Like you're, you're starting as someone who's just consuming a story, right? Sure. And then when, what was the evolution for you in terms of it being like, oh, this is a collectible or, oh, I'm going to collect this whole series or this certain comic book type. And then, and then at what point did it become like where you're actually buying and also selling? Like what was that progression for you? Uh, well, it was from that moment we walked into that first time we walked into that flea market and there was a comic book booth, right? And right. Got a dealer dealing comic books. And then it was, you know, 
going back every now and then, and then then it became going back every week, and then finding out. <laughs> <laughs> Before you know, you know it, you know the guy's name, you know how many kids he has. Pete's Comics, that's yeah, right. I know it to this day. <laughs> <laughs> I still have a box at home that he gave me that said Pete's Comics oh, on the side. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, exactly. That's got to mean something to you. It does, it does. Yeah. And, and then, you know, ooh, there's a comic book convention. I can go to a comic book convention. We lived outside New York City, so we started going to the comic book conventions. They were At the time, there were creation cons. Right, and it was right. like real stuff. You, you get the comic books there. You get to meet the artists there. Um, and it was really neat. And you can go and there's the artist. There's the comic book. Let me buy it. Let me get it autographed. Right. And I love getting it autographed. People tell me, why are you getting it autographed? It's going to ruin the value. <laughs> but it wasn't about value at the time. It was just about the fun of it, right? Yeah. Just collecting. The experience, exactly. right? Exactly. You know, having that moment. It also gave you an opportunity to like say hello. Yeah. Whereas like... You need kind of an icebreaker with people. Nowadays, hey, can I get a photo? No, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> right. But the autograph was a way of almost kind of like saying hello and then breaking into maybe even questions you may have had about those artists at the time, exactly. storytellers. Uh, you know, I was shy, I still am, and it was a way to talk to people, you know, to get me out of my shell a little bit. And, and were you starting like in the, in the early 80s then? Very early 80s, okay. yeah. Because like back then, like the comic book industry was very different than other forms of entertainment because everyone was approachable. Like you could walk up to Stan Lee and ha have a conversation with him. Absolutely. That wasn't unusual at a comic book convention. Yeah. Whereas, you know, up until recently, like with Comic-Con, you can kind of do that a little bit on a celebrity level unless it's like someone really high up. But right. back then, like every, every artist that's involved in a comic book, whether it's the writer, the penciler, the inker, the colorist, they were very like accessible. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it was pre-internet, too, so that was also another thing that made it unique is because with the internet, you're sort of have an opportunity to get into people's lives in sometimes weird ways. But back then, you would only be able to get to know people really in person unless they're on TV or something. But like in the comic book industry, like you could actually just strike up conversations with people. Exactly. And, and some of them I met when I was a kid. And, and here I was, my dad and myself, and they were just so impressed that, you know, a dad was taking his kid and spending the time and doing it. And they appreciated that. And so there are a lot of comic book artists. I think of Klaus Janssen, who was one of the earliest ones oh, yeah. I met, who I'm still friendly with to this day. Oh, wow. Um, you know, or Jack Kirby, you know, in, I think it was 1990, on one of my trips to California, he had me come over to his house. Um, and we hung out with him and Roz and, and, you know, my good friend who's now out here who's in the film industry. And, and we hung out. And, you know, they were trying to hook us up with their granddaughter. But, you know, it, 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 was, it, was, still kinda, it was still fun, you know? Yeah, and, yeah, you yeah. Know, hanging out with, with the Kirbys. And he's talking about Zappa. And, you know, we're out at his pool or showing us his drawing board. You know, it was just those kind of experiences, which I really appreciate. Um, and, and understand that I'm lucky to have had them. And yeah, even right. now to this day, I mean, I've been asked to curate and I've curated exhibits around the world. Right. Um, you know, we have family in London. So we went a couple of years ago and my son uh, loves the Kingsman, the movies. Right. He doesn't understand anything about Watchmen, the comic book, but <laughs> right. he loves the Kingsman, right? And it's Dave Gibbons. Right. And so I got a, you know, I hung out with Dave one day when, when I was there. And I'm like, hey, is it okay if we meet up again? And I bring Jacob. And he's like, yeah, bring him along. And, <laughs> and so we go, and Jacob's just so enthralled to meet the guy who drew the Kingsman right, series, right, right? right? He doesn't know anything about Watchmen. I'm like, Dave King, you know, Dave, you like know, this Dave is Gibbons. one of the greatest comic books of all time. Exactly. How come on? Exactly. Like, yeah. He did a great, you know, Green Lantern and, yeah. and whatnot. And he gave Jacob a drawing and, you know, oh, and wow. signed some books. And it was, you know, just those kind of experiences that, you know, I've had throughout my life, you know, that make me realize how, how lucky I am. You know, there are so many people who would love to have those experiences. Right. Um, and I just feel good about that. I mean, I, it sounds like uh, a, a big reason that you love the books is because of your relationship with your dad. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's like, like it takes you back. Like, it's great to know that you have that kind of connection. So I imagine when you go to a Comic-Con in a strange way, now that you have, you, you, you go with your son? We haven't actually gone to one yet. We were going to, and then the pandemic hit. Right, so. of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty big thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. I love that. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And, and so, so, for Mo, so, so the creation of Mocha, being this museum of, of, of comic and cartoon art is really just your love of that whole, like that bonding moment from then to teaching you how to like 
learn, like learn to learn, love to learn. Right. Uh, that's really incredible. And give back too, because at the time in my life, my wife was going to NYU to get her master's in early education. Uh -huh. And I was working the dot-com boom as general counsel. Okay. And the dot-com boom, the companies were making loads and loads of money. Didn't know how to spend it, right? You know, I right. could only buy so many pool tables and ping pong <laughs> and lunches. And yet I'm looking at my wife and her, and her classmates and they're taking these huge debts to, mm -hmm. to, to be able to teach. And then they're graduating, right, with all this debt. Yeah. Um, and they're being put into the schools, usually farthest away from them, um, into the hardest classrooms in the hardest schools without the right supplies. So now they're not being paid well. They got to pay all this debt. They right. got to pay to get there. Then they got to pay for out of their own pocket supplies and books. You know, we're, we're destroying our future, the future teachers and right. the future students. And I was like, well, how do I make a difference? How do I give back? I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm doing really well. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to give money to the New York public school system, but what can I do? to balance that out. What can I do to kind of help? And I thought, ooh, a Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art. Yeah. Ooh, that would be a great way to do it. You can use a political cartoon, right, and teach a little bit of history mm. that you may not get out of a whole history book. Right, right. right. Um, and I had this idea, and I started doing it, and I got a law, major law firm to work with us pro bono, an accounting firm to work with us pro bono, and I just started doing it. And that was May of 2001. And people told me, you're nuts. It'll never happen. <laughs> Other people with lots of money couldn't do it, couldn't get it done, or it went bankrupt or whatever. And I'm like, no, no, but I'm going to look at it in a different way. And we were supposed to get chartered on September 15th, 2001. Oh, wow. And, wow. you know, I was out walking my dog on September 11th, and, and I was supposed to be in the tower that morning, wow. uh, but decided to walk my dog and then go to the meeting there. And the rest is kind of history. Wow. And the museum got chartered a month later. And part of the idea of the Mocha Art Festival uh, was to do something downtown to bring people downtown. And so sure. we did it at the Puck Building uh, in the summer of 2002, and it was a huge hit, big wow. hit. And it was really a way to give back to the community and make a difference. And then we were the first nonprofit to move downtown as part of the downtown revitalization. So wow. all the things that I inspired to do or wanted to do um, actually happened for wrong reasons, but, right. but still happened. Wow. wow. That's incredible. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing, Lawrence. I'm like, I'm like, I'm just, I'm blown away, man. <laughs> I love the idea with cartoons in general in how they do tell uh, like a, a singular image. I mean, you can take a photo of something and it tells a singular image. Sure. But I like that how an artist can actually kind of play with it and, and you know, make it so make it so layered and so complex for something that seems so simple or so funny or so right. light, but it's so, it means so much more. Exactly. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I guess, did you bring in art of your own for this museum or were you from your own collections or is this things that you, you brought in other uh, exhibitors over time? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want it to be about my art collection. Sure. Because I didn't want there to be any conflicts. I wanted it to be about the art. So I didn't want there to be that issue. So I would reach out to different collectors that I knew and say, hey, can I borrow this for this exhibit? Or can, mm. can I borrow that? Or, or whoever was curating it, I would say, go right. to talk to this person, talk to that person. Um, and which was better. We didn't have it at the time. I didn't want to have a collection because I could borrow the best pieces. Right. And didn't have to worry about insurance or, or keeping it archivally safe for long periods of time. Right. Which was a big parts uh, other museums have an issue of cost. How long have you been collecting art, original artwork yourself? Since the early 80s. Okay. I'm so, so what are your views? That, like uh, the, the values have gone up. Like who could have ever imagined? Like what things sell for now? It's insane. I, I couldn't imagine. It's unbelievable. I don't know how someone enters this now. Yeah. I yeah. mean, because when I was a kid, you can, you know, sketches, you can get free sketches. Right. It's no big deal. Right. Like, original art piles of it. You could just yeah. look at it. You could afford it. There was an entry level for you. So if you liked a character, you could get it. Mm -hmm. Now I look at some of that entry art. An artist I don't even know. Now I'm not a full, I'm not fully involved in the hobby now, so I don't know all the artists, but right. I look at some of these names I don't know and I'm like, how are they, how are they charging $2,000 right. a page and, right. or, you know, or, or something like that. Um, and, and some of the older artwork, it's like, wow, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. Now, right. Um, and it's just, it, blows my mind. And then the interesting thing is, though, is, is the value of sort of more vintage era artwork you sure. know, from the 60s until especially like 60s, let's like, say, through 90s keeps blowing up. Mm -hmm. But then the comic book 
market is just collapsing. Like they're, you know, in terms of just the publishers and putting out new comic books, it seems mm. like it's kind of an art form that's going away. Like, sure. what are your thoughts on that? And where, where do you think it's headed? You know, that's a good question. I always wonder, <clears throat> you know, there are, there are artists, you know, like say comic strip artists who were popular in the day, in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, who nobody knows now. So their right. artwork at some point, maybe in the 50s, was valuable, and it's not now. Where is that going to be the same thing with comic book art? The people our age, right. um, we're going to get older, you know, and, you know and, and stop collecting and start selling. Who are the people who are going to follow us or follow the generation behind us right. sure. who are going to really care about it? Certain piece, pieces and certain comic books always will. And, and the industry's just got to evolve. Right. Um, we may not, I don't know how long we use paper for anything <clears throat> anymore. So right. does that matter? Does that make the old comics more collectible? Yeah. You know, nowadays, which I saw in the 90s, was, which got me out of collecting, was yeah. all the, all the, the, the variant you know, covers. Oh, my and goodness. All that. I remember yeah. in, the, in the mid 90s, they were just coming out with all these different covers, all these kitsch things, and the books were awful, and the art right. was awful, and the stories were awful. Yeah. And, and it's like, you got to get this cover and that cover and yeah. this variant. That's that when variant. I got out too, like sort of early 90s, and it was like, oh, this isn't. Right. It isn't what it was. Like it changed very dramatically. Where it's all about comics as collectibles rather than something telling a story. Exactly. I, I, you know, I'm from a small rural town in <clears throat> Idaho, and we had a, a sports cards comic book st shop, and they'd sell right. like magic cards simultaneously. Right. And I was maybe like 10 or 11 years old, and that was kind of my first real introduction to comics. And at that time, it was Spawn. Like Spawn yeah. came out, and it mm -hmm. was really big, and I would go there and I would play Magic the Gathering. Really, I was like Cody? super nerdy. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> wow. Like it was like, but I was like, but I hung out with these kids and we would, we'd play these card games. And I did that for a couple of years, but like I'd go there and it was other people that were much older than me and we'd play these card games until like nine o'clock at night. But it was my first real experience into that kind of universe. And now that universe is so much bigger. Right. Uh, there's so many more people. And I also think like comic book values, for example, you know, all of this is pumped up by the media's love of the movies mm -hmm. and you bringing it into a new generation that finds it more interesting, which in turn reminds the old generation that has money right. to say, oh, I want some of that original stuff. I loved it. So I'm willing to pay X amount for it. But I, I mean, long term, I don't really see how I don't, I don't necessarily know how you can continue to charge, how, how they can continue to sell that way, especially if a fan base kind of disappears, right? I think comics are going to go like, like this, you know, like the K, mm -hmm. the K curve, right? You're going to have key issues, historical right, and modern, right, right, that are right. going to go up in value yeah. as collectibles. And then the rest is just going to fall, fall out. out. Yeah. Right. Well, exactly. yeah, I mean, that's what I found sort of curating a comic book collection from a celebrity years ago. You know, there was just tens of thousands of issues of things. And I, I knew comic books, I knew comic book values growing up because I used to like buy and sell at conventions and things like that. But that's what I found. It was all from, from the eighties, like you could have a whole run of like daredevil or yeah. things like that. Right. But it's really just like the number one issue, it's first appearances mm -hmm. in certain runs, like by Frank Miller and right, you know, like exactly. Klaus Janssen that you mentioned, yeah. things like that. But then the rest are like almost essentially worthless. Right. It's, it's, Weird. It's right, yeah. weird. And there's also a lot of hype now, whether it's on YouTube or wherever, mm -hmm. of people hyping books to, to sell them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's kind of ruining things a little bit as well because right. there's, there's no real value. And so people are putting all their money into these books um, you know, because they're slabbed and they're a 9.8 or something. Right. But they have no other really intrinsic value to it, yeah. no historic value. Um, and I saw that years ago. There was a comic book shop near me that started a, a magazine with pricing. And I noticed that when I went into the comic book shop, if they didn't have a lot of that book, the price in their magazine, which everybody was looking at, was kind of low. Right. But if oh, they had a lot, the prices were high. Oh, right. interesting. So oh, really? I'm not saying there was anything nefarious there. No. It was just my, my <laughs> Your observation. Version, my right. observation of it. Exactly. Exactly. You yeah. can take away what you choose. Well, I, and I, I guess to kind of go back to what you're saying about where we're seeing things, you know, the way we tell stories, it's always changing, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. new mediums allow for us to kind of change the way we tell stories. And like seeing that, you're talking about how comic books are kind of 
they're falling out from beneath themselves. Nobody's well, yeah, buying because there's them. no comic book stores anymore, so the distribution's kind of going away. And I don't know how much young people are really into like physical media anymore. Right, I exactly. mean, everything's on their phones, but you can't get comic books on phones and yeah. iPads and things like yeah, that. Yeah, there's digital apps that like DC and Marvel created where you can buy right. them directly, yeah. right? Like shops. Yeah, yeah. It's just then now it's 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 more about the story than at that point than it is so much about the art, which. I mean, you still want interesting visuals. Right. It's, you're just not going to be able to. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's just a shame because it, it's, it's a very unique storytelling medium. Like um, Scott McCloud's like Understanding sure, Comics. Of course. Like the, this guy did this whole graphic novel that was basically a comic book explaining how comic books work and how the visual art form has like evolved going back to like cavemen and, hmm. you know, and how, how, to, how to read comics. Right, because people take it for granted. But if someone's never looked at a comic book, how do they know like to read from sure. left to right and yeah, you know, visualize it that right, way? Right, right. Now let's come back to me for a moment because I've got yeah. a good story about that. Scott McCloud. So I, when I was in high school, I started the Rambo Senior High School Comic Book Convention, um, and. Uh, of it, course you did. Yeah. Okay. Another, <laughs> another thing, you know, in, in high school, you know, the geek, what, what are you going to do? And it ended up being a really successful convention that went on for 10 years and sure. brought in a lot of money to the school. Um, but Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, the convention. You were charging fees to get in? and Minimal. Minimal. It was the tables from the, the vendors. Yeah. And, oh, wow. ended, you know, it ended up, we, I needed to go the school board, you know, the student board wouldn't sure. give us a loan for the first one. And so I went to the principal and said, hey, can you help? And he's like, sure, but you gotta pay it back. And I'm like, I guarantee we'll pay it back. <laughs> and after the convention went, paid it right back, because the first one, it did so well. Paid it, was, it right back, and they're like, thanks, teach. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then, and then, then after that, it, again, it became so successful, so it would help yearbook and buy a full page in the yearbook, or this club, or that club. But right. at one of them, Scott McLeod was gonna come, and he lived in Westchester County, across the river mm -hmm. from where we were. And my dad went to pick him up and bring him to the con. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You're like, like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And so. you did that for how long? I ran it for the first two years with uh -huh. a couple of the teachers and then went to college and couldn't focus on that anymore. And, but I would go back at, you know, every year pretty much. And they were still running it because oh, yeah. it was making money for the school at that exactly. point. Exactly. And, and the teachers were just, there were these two teachers that were involved and they just loved it. And the kids who were in the club were having a ball with it. And wow. it was just a, a fun thing to do. And, and it was great that it started. And it became really, really well known in, the, in that area. I mean, we had an EC con one time. You know, we had all these, when Valiant was big, they came. And, you know, it was just all these really great people were coming to it. And people really enjoyed it because I started it not to be a business but to be a fun thing you know right, 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 right. the dealers were there to sell the art community they, yeah exactly i had free p i got a pizza places to donate pizza so that we could all oh, go wow. into a back room and get pizza <laughs> I mean, it was just all that neat neat stuff and it was just fun to do and that's that's what i enjoyed about the hobby you know that community right 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 so coming out of this weird well maybe we're not even coming out but coming <laughs> out of the weird covid world and era like what do you have any plans for like how because it seems like you're always sort of coming up with ways to sort of build events and communities and sure. things around celebrating comic books. So like what's, what's in your future? Well, I curated an exhibit in August that was supposed to happen last year that got postponed and it was a comic and cartoon art exhibit and went really, really well, but I'm looking to do another one in a year and uh, maybe two and then, you know, do some more international exhibits uh, and just have fun with that. And I, and I want to get out and, you know, where I live, there aren't many, collectors like me, you know, geeks like me right. who collect props or, or toys or comics. Right. Um, and I, I want to start getting out again and, and seeing friends and make new friends right. uh, who do collect so I can go look and see what they have. I love that. I love hearing the stories, although I seem to be doing a lot of the talking. I love hearing the stories <laughs> yeah. of other collectors. How do you get this? Why do you get this? Um, and what, what's your favorite piece? How are you connected to it? Right. Um, and I'm connected to most of the stuff I have. I admit it. I'm sentimental. I don't want to sell. Um, not yet, and, right. but I just enjoy having it. Right, right, right. It means something to you. I mean, obviously, yeah. you've, you've kind of built a almost a legacy off of this stuff, which yeah. is which is fantastic. I mean, good for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now I'm you know looking forward to doing things. You know, my son is interested in. He's 14. He's interested in coins now. So we're starting with yeah. basic coins and things like that. Awesome. awesome. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Each week we ask the question. Do you want to touch it? I'm going to make a little squishy noise there. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence, 
You've brought in some items. We kind of have them flat on the ground. So what you at home are watching, we'll cut, we'll cut a through, we'll cut through and show some of each of these. And then maybe we can have Lawrence kind of even show you what we've got here. Um, so Lawrence, what do we have? So I do a lot of pro bono work and, and legal work for different comic and cartoonists. Okay. And one of the artists that I've done legal work for and I'm helping out as well is a guy named Ed Hannigan. Mm -hmm. Ed has been in the comic book industry for, since the 70s. And for a long time, he was, you know, did a lot of cover designs for the comic books for Marvel and DC in the 80s. Cool. And he's done work on Defenders and Batman and all these cool things. And he also worked in, when he was with DC a lot in DC marketing. And so what I, I have here... And maybe you can see. Is that George Clooney? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Is that the George Clooney one? Or was that the Val, Val Kilmer? Kilmer? That was Val Kilmer. So right now, he, so this is for a design right. for one of the video games. Oh. And these are all <gasps> designs for the game. I think I know this game. That's what I was saying. Right. Yeah. For the, for like the box cover. Yeah. Earlier. Exactly. Yeah. So it's for the box cover. And there's a whole bunch of them here. I, I'm going I'm to pull some up if we can. Oops. Yeah, let me, yeah. Let me pull some of these up. We got, you see there, we've got uh, old, uh, old Batsy and Robin. Batsy. Look at that. We've got old uh, the Riddler and Two-Face. <laughs> Gotham City at night. Those are really amazing. So yeah. this paper is just like, so they, do, they don't color on this. They just do the basic illustration and then from there. Well, this is actually a prelim. So these okay. are his designs. And then, then he does like a, a, a more uh, detailed drawing. Yeah. And so it's more like it. different compositions. And then it's like, okay, of these, which composition sort of like speaks to you but and the thing about this is that this is what ed was known for like his detailed prelims i mean look at these prelims yeah They're i mean really for a prelim detailed. i was like this is my final drawing right exactly <laughs> after 27 hours you know i can't even get there after 27 years <laughs> yeah so, right know. exactly right, you know, right, so, right so so ed uh unfortunately has ms and he's in a nursing home now and mm -hmm. so you know we've been i've been helping him try to sell some art and on the <sighs> website comic art uh, fans.com he's going we're going to be doing uh selling some art uh for ed and we've done it we pre-taped an interview with ed that'll be part of that oh great uh, but i don't you know but at any point um we're trying to you know help ed raise more money by selling some of his remaining art were you a dc or a marvel guy growing up you know, I was probably more Marvel, but I loved the Teen Titans. Oh, you did? Okay. I did. I, okay. and, and the interesting thing is we come back to California with that story, yeah. is that being living in New York, the early issues were really hard to get. And there was no internet. I couldn't go online and buy it uh, at the local comic book stores, but they had them all over the West Coast. And my parents were visiting, and every day I would get a call from my parents, especially my dad, saying, hey, <laughs> we found it. We found Teen <laughs> Titans number two. Hey. We found it. We found Teen <laughs> Titans number one. And I'd be like, oh, wow, this is awesome. And, you know, and then he, he, they, you know, filled in the collection up to, I think it was number 11 was the first one I was able to get. And, yeah, I'm trying to remember when that started. Because I, I collected that for like a run when it, was it like Marv Wolfman that? Yeah, Marv Wolfman, George Perez. Okay. Romeo Tango. And that's when they had like, was it Death? Deathstroke? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All, yeah, that whole run yeah, was exactly. like really good. Because oh, it, yeah. it was sort of more like. DC's version of the X Men or New exactly, Mutants, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And so yeah. that that was my favorite. I loved X Men, New Mutants, Wolverine. Uh, those were probably my two favorite books. Oh wow! Uh, and and some of the I wasn't always big into Superman, Batman. It depended on who was writing it. Yeah. Um, you know, in the other Marvel comics, you know, same thing. It depends on who was writing. I was a big fan of Bill Mantlo, and you know, it was able to help him do some legal work as well more recently. Um, oh wow! So you know, it's. It, it was a lot of fun and all dependent on the great storylines. And I remember they talked about the death of comics, especially DC in the 90s, and then The Dark Knight came out. Right. It was at the 80s. It's yeah, all, the, like 86. It's, it's all getting bundled in my head. Yeah, that's yeah. right, 86. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, then Dark Knight came out and that changed everything. And that was an amazing book, don't get me wrong. I loved it. Do you think it's the, you think it's the, 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 the fact that they're kind of regurgitating so many stories and it's hard to tell a new story? That, 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 that's the challenge with comic books? Or do you just think the medium's kind of waned because I think people don't more, want a physical... Yeah, I think it's more just sort of the, the commerce side of it has changed so much because comic book stores are going away. Like AT&T owns DC now, right? Sold it. Yeah, oh, they, they did. did. The yeah, Discovery yeah. or whatever it yeah, was. Exactly. Oh, yeah. See, I mean, it's all just sort of like no one really is, that's owning DC the comics seems to care about it as comics. It's more about IP, like, oh, now we own Batman. It's not like, right. how do we make 
cool comic books anymore. It's more like how do we make this into like a, a cartoon or animated thing that makes money or a film. Right. Well, you know? that's what happened to Marvel, you know, many years ago, a couple yeah. of decades ago. They just did a better job <laughs> of making movies that are well, successful. But right? I'm talking even before that is yeah. when, you know, they went, you know, public the first time and it was, you know, they, they were hoping to cash in the IP rights. Right. And then just ignored the comic books. And right. then they went bankrupt or declared yeah. bankruptcy and then, yeah. you know, came out of it and focused on the comic books and the core work. Um, and then, you know, look at what happened. Right, right, right. So as someone who's an attorney and loves comic books, when, when was the, sort of the change of when the artists got their comic book artwork back? Because the publishers used to keep it, right? And then, exactly. And then basically a change where they, they got their artwork back and they could sell it as artwork, but they don't have any, like, rights over the characters or the actual images to be reproduced in any other way, right? Correct. Yeah, I, I believe it happened in the, started to happen in the late 70s. <clears throat> okay. That they got, that they started to get the comic book. Because by the time I started collecting and was involved with comic book art, uh, the artists got the pages back. Right. So that was, right. so that was part of their agreements. Like, yeah. if you're, if you're doing the art, you get the original art back. Correct. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because yeah, originally the, the you know, comic book publishers would keep it. Right. And usually destroy it. Mm -hmm. Or just let it sit and rot. Right. Uh, so it wasn't, you know, getting, you know, doing anything. It's like the whole story with what was it, Kurt Warner, Kent Warner from uh, Props. You know, he went in the Warner. Uh, the, oh, uh, yeah. With the ruby shoes and stuff right, like that. Right, they right. were getting rid of it, and he pulled out the key things to save them and stuff right, like that. Right. So that that was happening. People were taking it, trying to save some of that artwork. Uh, but it was just going away. So the artists wanted the artwork back, and then mm. they were able to sell it. Um, to get a little bit extra money because back then it wasn't right. as valuable as it yeah. is now. Right. Wow. Well, that's pretty incredible. I mean, you. so you're a collector. What was the first thing you ever got? What was the first page? What was, you know? Oh, yeah, though, this I remember. Um, we, my dad and I were at a convention. I think we were at the Roosevelt Hotel in New York City. It was a creation con. And uh, there were, you know, all the tables, and there was a table of Neil, a Neil Adams was there. Mm -hmm. And at the oh, time, right. Neil Adams was, was at his prime, like in, in fandom. And he had all these drawings on his table. And I was like, oh, dad, wouldn't it be great to have a Neil Adams drawing? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, and it looked like, I think they were like $75 a piece. <laughs> and back then, that's like the early 80s. And it's like, yeah. wow. I mean, you know, and my dad's like, you know, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. But that's like 100 brand new comic books, right? Exactly, time, yeah. Like maybe more, yeah. Oh, more, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and or you know some older comic books, but yeah. still, you know. So, but across the way was a, a a comic art dealer, and I didn't really know what comic art dealers were back then. But he right. had this big portfolio, and we're looking, and, and he's got a portfolio full of Neil Adams covers, original art, the covers to a whole bunch of the books, and he's there's a sign fifty percent off. Wow. Yes. So you're like, hey, Neil Adams over here. Did you, you see, see what's happening <laughs> oh, over yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm keeping quiet first. Now I'm a kid. Yeah. And my dad's like, like, this is something we should look at. And, and the 50% off made it the same price as the sketches that Neil Adams was selling it for. Oh, okay. And so we're looking and we're looking and we find them. And we find this one, pay, you know, one cover we really like. And my dad's like, all right. And he goes to the guy. You think he'll autograph it? He's like, I don't know. And my dad's like, well, if he autographs it, we'll buy it. And the guy's like, all right, here. So he gives it to me. And my dad's like, go get it. Go see if he'll autograph it. So I go running over to Neil Adams. I go, would you autograph this? He goes, yes. So I go running back to my dad saying he'll autograph it. So my dad's like, go back and get him to autograph it. So I go running back to Neil Adams. I say, would, would you please autograph it? And he autographs it. I go running back to my dad. And the guy behind the, de the table goes, all right, now that it's autographed, it's double the price. And my dad's like, what? And... My dad doesn't have the greatest sense of humor. Sure. I got it. <laughs> yeah, dad, yeah, yeah. And the guy's like, no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we bought it, and, and that was my first piece of original comic book art, Neil Adams cover. Wow. wow. That yeah. was a cover, too. Cover. I still have oh, it. Oh, geez. Wow. What is it from? World's Finest. Oh, wow. It's got who's, Superman, who's on and, it? Superman and Hawkman. Oh, that's awesome. And the awesome. Tempter. And actually, if you look at it really closely, you can see that he originally drew... Hawkman and Superman in the other role, uh -huh. oh. but they must have said we want Superman up front, so he redrew it with Superman up front. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yep. That's kind of cool. What issues that? And I can put it right here next to your head right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool, huh? I like that. <laughs> I like it a lot. That's good. That's good. <laughs> oh wow, it's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's it, that was that's the first piece. Wow. 
Uh, Lawrence, I mean, this is really, well, really we have cool this one stuff. To talk I guess we've got one final oh, one piece One more, here. yeah. So I'll hold this up real quick. because That I one's color versus everything else we've exactly. got. Exactly. This is one of yeah, Ed's uh, covers for Marvel Comics, and it was uh, Elvira. Wow. And I figured it would be appropriate because you just we had just, the yeah, auction. We just, we just had the big Elvira auction that was... You know, exactly. When gangbusters. And so that's a good example of just one of his covers. And he, again, he's done lots and there's lots of these. Uh, he, he was lucky. He saved these. Right. Um, yeah. Got, got a lot of them back. And so a lot of famous comic book covers he did. You don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Um, and some fun ones too. Wow. Well, you know, Lawrence, thank you so much for bringing yeah. this stuff in and sharing it with us. If thank people you. wanted to follow your future endeavors, unfortunately, the MOCA is no longer in business. It's part of the Society of Illustrators in okay. New York City. So yeah. is the Society, is that, do they have a museum for people to view? Or they is have it, their own museum. They yeah. have their own museum. Oh. There's okay. like a little little tiny hallway to the bathroom that's the MOCA hallway. <laughs> but otherwise than that, and I, I say that in, in, in jest. Yeah, of yeah. course, of course. But, you know, they have, their, it's a great organization, and it's a, it's a great brownstone if you're in New York City to go yeah. see. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, is there anywhere people can follow you, check you out online? Um, I don't really have a big social online social media presence. No worries. I'm old school. That's okay. Well, we but, appreciate uh, it. Thank you so much for coming on yeah, the show. Thank you thank for you having so me. This was great. Well, yeah, we had a good time. We had a good time. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of That Pop Culture Show. Join us next week when Jason and I say Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Ho, ho, ho. Keep on popping. Here with you, isn't that so?